The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. Uh, this was a point definitively settled. The very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season that I uh, encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you were luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How, said he, Amontillado, a pipe? Impossible. In the middle of a carnival? I have my doubts, I replied. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you on the matter. Uh, you were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado? And I must satisfy them. Amontillado! As you are engaged, I am on my way, Lucchese. Uh, if one has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. <coughs> With her. <coughs> to your vault. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Look, Casey. <coughs> I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Immortalado. Oh, you have been imposed upon. And this Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Montiano. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a requilar closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I would not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, uh, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. <coughs> the pipe, he said. Uh, it is further on, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of his intoxication. Nitre, he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. Uh, how long have you had that cough? <laughs> my poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It, it is nothing, he said at last. 
Come, I said. Uh, we will go back. Your health is precious. Uh, you're rich, respected, admired, beloved. You were happy as once I was. Uh, you were a man to be missed, and for me it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. And besides, there is uh, Lucchese. Enough! He said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. Uh, true, I replied. Uh, but you should use all proper caution. A draught of this Madoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, representing him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. Uh, uh, these vaults, he said, uh, are extensive. The Montressas, I replied, were a great and numerous family. Uh, oh, uh, I forget your arms. A huge human foot door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune la chesset. No one provokes me with impunity. Oh, <coughs> good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes, and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the Madoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons, intermingling in the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The night hour, I said. Uh, see, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. Uh, we're below the river's bed. Uh, the drops of moisture trickle upon the bones. Come, we will go back it's before it's too late. Your cough. <coughs> it is nothing, he said. Let us go on, but uh, first another drop of the Madoc. I broke and raged him a flock on of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. Uh, you, you do not uh, comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Uh, then uh, you're not of the Brotherhood. How? You are <coughs> not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I replied. Yes. You? Impossible, a Mason. A Mason, I replied. A sign. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my requilar. Uh, you jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Uh, be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended passed on and descending again arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the old catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet in width, three in height, six or seven. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depths of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Here is Amontillado. As for Lucchese, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I fetted him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astonished to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Uh, pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. 
Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all a little attention to my power. The Martiado! ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. Uh, true, I replied, the Montiardo. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low, moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth. And then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. Ah! Ah! A succession of loud and shrill screams, bursting suddenly from the throat of the chain form, seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the elves. I re-echoed. I surpassed them in volume and length. I did this, and a clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> a very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We'll have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> the Montalano, I said. <laughs> yes, the Montalano. But is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting us at the palazzo, the Lady Fortunato, and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montessa! Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. Fortunato! No answer. I called again. Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth and returned only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. 
and the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease with the incidence of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were hotly populated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massive hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned, and with such precautions the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons. There were improvisatory. There were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was a red death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade, but first let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and at each turn a novel effect. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, and the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. Now in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite there stood, opposite to each window, a heavy tripod, bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical but of so peculiar a note in emphasis that at each lapse of an hour the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzes perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole company. 
And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled, as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows each to the other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion, and then after the lapse of sixty minutes, which embraced three thousand and six hundred seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decor of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fate, and it was his guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. Uh, there were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm. Much of what has been since seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies, such as the madman fashion. There were much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers there stalk, in fact, a multitude of dreams, and these are dreams writhe in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then... For a moment, all is still, and all is silent, say the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chimes die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells, and the dreams live and ride to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tainted windows through which dreams are raised from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery of Paul's. And to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. And the revel went whirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzes were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept, but more of time into the meditations of a thoughtful among those who reveled. Thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur expressive of disapprobation and surprise, and finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out Herod Herod, and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters at which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved, 
by the mad revelers around, but the mama had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow with all the features of the face was besprinkled with a scarlet horror. When the eyes of the Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzes, he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste. But in the next his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely, the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise for the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the Prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now with deliberate and stately step made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mama had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while a vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger, and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which instantly afterward fell prostrate in death the Prince of Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment and seizing the mama, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with such violent rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay. And the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all.